Hello. I want to present today some of the global trends in climate change litigation. This is a work that we do at the Grantham Research Institute at the LSE, monitoring developments and trends in climate litigation. So first of all, it's important to notice that climate change litigation is not just one type of case or those cases that you might have seen of uh, NGOs suing governments or major corporations for inaction on climate change. It's a quite mixed and uh, diverse group of cases that of course involves those cases, but also involves planning applications of coal power plants and applications of renewables such as wind power, and also cases dealing with deforestation or even the allocation of allowances within the EU trading scheme. So a very diverse group of cases that we um, know as being uh, part of this uh, climate litigation. Where we monitor this is through these two data bases that are open access and available to everyone. And I would recommend that you give a look at what we have there. So the LSE and the Grantham Research maintain the climate change laws of the world database, which has all the climate laws and policies that are related to climate change, as well as climate litigation outside of the US. We know of over 2000 climate laws and policies and we know also that there are over 1,800 cases around the world. The majority of cases are in the US and we maintain this uh, part of the database together with our colleagues at the Sabin Center at Columbia University where they track both US climate litigation and non-US climate litigation. So with these two databases, you should be able to access uh, not only the, the cases and a summary, but also documents that are relevant and uh, again, all the laws and policies uh, around the world. Now, focusing on climate change litigation, what we observe is that the cases are continue to grow. I mentioned that the majority of cases are in the US and in this graph that we have uh, data until May 2021, you can see how the majority is in the US, but how climate litigation is growing everywhere around the world. So in the, in the report that we published in July, we have um, analyzed the cases between May 2020 and May, May 2021. And, and this is a group of 191 cases filed in the US and outside of the US. And most of my presentation, I will uh, then look into some of these trends. What we observe, and again, this is in the report, is that the number of strategic litigation cases is growing. Strategic litigation, we consider, and of course that's a subjective consideration to a certain extent, but we consider as the cases that have the aim of bringing a, 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 some kind of change, a message, testing a new doctrine or uh, testing uh, a, a new strategy in a specific jurisdiction. These are the cases that maybe you might have read in the newspapers, such as the Urgenda case and many cases that then followed the Urgenda or cases against corporations. What we see here is that the proportion of strategic cases over time has grown. Um, and, and this is again, focused on the outside of the US. What's important to notice, however, is that not all strategic litigation is aligned with climate goals. Indeed, there are a number of cases that are filed by governments or by corporations that are challenging uh, climate aligned or initiatives or policies that try to bring about uh, more stringent regulation or uh, require more action from uh, different actors. What we also try to see is where this climate litigation is going. So what are the outcomes of uh, these cases? Here again, looking at cases outside of the US, we notice that there is a the proportion of outcomes of uh, tend to be more towards the favorable side. So there is there are more cases that are leading to a, a, a climate aligned uh, direction than cases that are challenging climate policies. And we do that by looking at the reason and and, and the drivers of the case, how the decision was made, and therefore understanding whether the final outcome is favorable, unfavorable, or neutral. Again, it's important then to notice that not 
all the outcomes are restricted to a court decision. Indeed, the cases might have impacts beyond the court, even if unsuccessful. So we have a number of examples of cases that have not been successful and nevertheless already created some change, for example, in corporate behavior when it's, they consider that there is an increasing risk of litigation um, towards a particular sector, for, for instance. Now, we also look at who is involved in, this, uh, in these cases. And looking at the past year, it's interesting to notice that in the US and outside of the US, in 191 cases filed, over 70% 70, 70 of cases were filed against governments. And when we say governments, of course, we're bringing together a number of different governmental entities, but we have their subnational governments, but also other governmental agencies, such as uh, regulators, financial regulators, and even central banks. Who, who, who is filing the, these cases? Well, over 60% of these cases have been filed by NGOs or individuals, or both acting together. And we've also noticed a, a diversity in terms of who's bringing cases. We have here the, in this illustration, uh, the Supreme Court of Brazil, because this is where recently a group of uh, political parties of the opposition filed a case against the government. And by doing that also, they influenced the, uh, how, how the case progressed in that the case is filed directly before the Supreme Court. I would like to finish this short presentation by perhaps presenting climate litigation in, uh, in this uh, spectrum of pre and post 2015. This is against uh, in cases against governments where 2015 we've seen a really important landmark decision with the Urgenda case and a number of cases that then followed Urgenda asking similarly governments to be more active or to enforce legislation that had been already passed but was not being enforced. Um, specifically here in cases against governments, we observe that many of these cases are challenging governments for the commitments that they made and how their actions on the ground might not be consistent to those commitments. So we find 37 systemic cases that are trying really like agenda to get governments to legislate and to have more stringent targets. But we also find cases that are challenging specific acts or omissions or cases that are challenging the authorization to third party activities. Now, um, to finish, cases against corporations also have quite considerably changed in the last few years. Before 2015, we had a number of cases that had not been successful and that had dealt with a number of hurdles, particularly standing and jurisdiction. Um, and, and many of these issues actually have been now um, if not completely reversed, but um, there are many interesting developments that might change the outcomes of a number of these cases that are still ongoing. So after 2015, we see first a different use of science or more science that is available that um, is able to support these cases. Science that shows uh, the, who are the polluters and how much they have contributed, but also attribution science. And we also see um, how the strategies against corporates is, have gone beyond uh, cases that claim for compensation to cases that bring the financial risk involved with climate change. And this has been made clear by Mark Carney, of course, in that uh, well-known speech he gave about the materiality of climate risks. And we also see a number of other interesting cases that, for example, raise issues of greenwashing related to advertisements by fossil fuel companies. So to finish, uh, I would like to show this graph, which shows that sometimes uh, cases against the private sector are very much targeted at uh, particular companies, for example, the carbon majors, but also cases against governments might indirectly impact those companies uh, as creating a transition risk. The moment, for example, where the uh, government in the Netherlands was required to phase out coal, of course, that decision will then trigger um, changes that will affect the corporate sector. So climate litigation, as you can see, has diversified. There are a number of cases against different sectors, 
from the carbon majors to uh, agriculture and meat producers to the financial markets and, and legislators and uh, regulators. So um, I will stop here for now and I'm looking forward to the discussion on the 13th of October. Thank you.